Well, good afternoon. You know, I'm an, I'm an astronomer who does uh, talks about the climate crisis for the Climate Reality Project. I've been doing this for about five years, many dozens of talks, and my, my lovely wife has come to several of those talks, and she said to me recently, she said, Jim, I just don't think I can go to one of your depressing talks again. <laughs> and, and I can understand why she feels like that, because although Americans have started to connect the dots between uh, extreme weather events and, and, and the climate crisis, there, there's, a, there's a huge change. Uh, also, because I, I come from a, a childhood of watching grade B science fiction movies, and astronomers like myself know that the best way to get the attention of Earthlings is with cosmic doom. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but I want to talk to you today about it that as an astronomer thinking about the climate crisis, that actually there's a lot of good reasons for hope and a lot of good reasons to think this, this business is all going to improve. But, if, but nevertheless, if you go back and talk to most Americans, some 42% of Americans would agree with the statement that there's nothing an individual can do to avert the, the global climate change. And if you rank uh, the, the threat of global warming against 21 other challenges for Americans, it comes in dead last in terms of priority. In fact, it's slipped 13% in just the last few years. So this is a, a, a tremendous challenge for people to get their head around and, and so on. And yet, the fact is that we're putting 7 billion tons of carbon pollution into the atmosphere every year and it's not going away. In fact, that takes hundreds, if not thousands of years to wash itself out. And uh, so then anyways, that's why I've dedicated myself to doing a lot of these sorts of talks, or similar talks. Now, uh, before I tell you why we have a little bit of hope, and why that hope may actually be staring us in the face, I wanted to, uh, maybe I should tell you how I got to be a prophet of doom. Uh, it started in 2006. I and five million other Americans watched An Inconvenient Truth and I was not only terrified, I was super terrified because as an astrophysicist, I can connect the dots and see how things fit together and understand how the climate system works. And I knew that this was a real challenge going on here. So uh, the, that same summer I went to a science meeting where one of my colleagues said to me, he says, you know, Vice President Gore is looking for others to help do this talk and help bring the word out. I have a global uh, business in helping people build digital planetariums around the world. So I thought at that time it would be good for me to start doing these talks, if only to help my colleagues who reach some four or five million people a year. So back in 2007, January, I went to do talks and I got trained by Mr. Gore. That's my brother on the left. He's a banker, if you could believe it. And so uh, uh, he and I are very different in the sort of things we do in our daily life. But, but in terms of this, we're both very dedicated to this cause. But as I said, I'm the one with the stars in my eyes. I spend my time thinking about stars, thinking about things off the earth more than most people. Uh, so I thought that to help you appreciate how we could do something about the climate crisis that's actually quite hopeful, that I'd, I'd tell you about it from an astronomer's point of view. So I want to warn you that there's astronomy ahead in this talk. It's going to be like being back in uh, freshman year 101. Uh, and to warn you about it, whenever you see the little star up in the upper left-hand corner, that means I'm getting into astronomy, <laughs> which will be most of the talk. Uh, anyways, the first thing an astronomer does when they think about this problem, they think, holy moly. He said, look, at the, that's the planet Earth. Our, plan, our atmosphere is that thin blue line, as you can see along the curving edge there. It's extremely thin. There's not much of an atmosphere there at all, and it's quite unique. So, to an astronomer, it's like we shouldn't be messing with something that's really quite so precious. Uh, and we know that it's just a, just a few hundred parts per million of carbon dioxide in that atmosphere that actually acts as the blanket to keep the heat in and keep us warm. And the reason we know this is because we can compare with our, our neighbors. Uh, Venus, uh, our nearby planetary neighbor, uh, has way too much carbon dioxide and its temperature is like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Mars has barely a wisp of a sheet covering it at night, and it's like down to minus 65 degrees as so little carbon dioxide blanketing. Whereas for the Earth, it's been at around 290 parts per million for many millions of years, and that turns out to be absolutely perfect for the types of environments and life that we know on planet Earth, where the average temperature is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Now, a lot of people will say, gee, a few hundred parts per million, that's really not a lot. And it, it isn't. In fact, if you took all the people, if you filled this, you took all the seats in this audience and compared that to the city of Chicago's population, that's a few hundred parts per million. So it seems like a very small concentration. 350 is really the target we should aim at, and we'll have actually events next week garnered around 350. But I have people also say to me, that, Jim, this is just not that much. You can't even see carbon dioxide. How could it matter? So I have a little demonstration to show you. I think Brad's here with the things. And I'm going to show you what that really means. Because astronomers are used to seeing the invisible. We, we launch telescopes in space to see infrared light, which is where carbon dioxide does its thing. And uh, so I'm going to show you how to see uh, something that's generally quite invisible. So Brad is here. I have a. So I'm going to show you what 280 parts per million is. This is a, a beaker of about a half of a liter of water. If I just put four drops of ink in it, get the ink to come out. Let's see. Hang on one second. <laughs> it's great to have an assistant. One. Well, give me the other dropper, maybe. This one. And the trick is to see that we don't get ink on him, because it can get to be pretty messy. But this is the way science is, right? You have to keep working on your experiments. <laughs> you always have a backup system. Here we go. So anyways, four drops of ink, two, three, four. This is 280 parts per million. So if some people say that that's not a lot, you can see that that can be a lot if you could actually see it, right? And actually, we are now, we've added, since the beginning of the, of the carbon fossil fuel burning area, we've added two more drops. It's getting almost totally black. And what's really, really scary is to, we're going to add another nine drops before the end of the coming century if we don't change our carbon habits. And now it's almost totally perfectly black. Thank you, Brad. Okay, so 280 parts per million can be an awful lot, and it really can get to be pretty scary. But it's going to stay in the atmosphere for a thousand years, and you might think that's a long time, but you know, for an astronomer, that's nothing. And so another thing we need to appreciate is that our use of carbon fuels in the last 200 years is part of a much bigger story, a much bigger story that we're participating in, and actually we have to have responsibility for in the future. So I, let me give you an idea of what this story is like. If I make myself into a cosmic timeline, with uh, my left fingertips, uh, the Big Bang, and the, my right fingertips, April 28, 2012, today, 14 billion years. This is the history of the universe, from my left fingertip to my right fingertips. The first stars and galaxies formed right around my palm here, our galaxy here. And for billions and billions of years, generation upon generation of stars created elements like the carbon and the oxygen and the calcium in our blood and, and seeded the galaxy back again. By my right bicep, our solar system formed. That's when our sun and planets formed. That's when those elements came to us. And then all along here, our Earth evolved. By my right wrist, life on Earth invented photosynthesis, at which time they were able to take in light and other elements and put oxygen into the atmosphere so we could have an atmosphere very much like the one we know today. Right at my right knuckle here, the, the Earth was covered with giant forests that lived for 100 million years, these forests. And this is where most of the carbon that's powering even the lights in this room today came from and was sequestered. And, and we, where did we fit into all this? Well, on this scale, if you just take the last 200 years when we've been burning fossil fuels, on this scale, that would be the size of a cold virus. So in a cosmic time frame, our use of fossil fuels is, is really a, a, a tick of time. It's like a tiny paragraph in a gigantic book. And it's a book that we're now writing. We've benefited from all this in the past. It's now imperative upon us to take responsibility for writing the next chapter for how this is used. We know that that's going to involve energy. And I often teach energy to undergraduates. And sometimes I use this energy flow diagram here. This is for the United States. 
And believe me, trying to teach this is like trying to instruct someone how to drive an automobile by just only looking under the hood of the car. It doesn't really work too well. So uh, what I'm going to suggest today also is, is just an easier way to go at this. This also reminds me, as an astronomer, of uh, a theory of the solar system from Claudius Ptolemy. Uh, this solar system model was created around 150 AD and was basically had the Earth at the center. It's geocentric. And it has all these cycles upon cycles to, to explain the planets and how the planets work and save the appearances, as they would have said. When you put it all together, here's the Earth at the center and all these planets going around. For 1,400 years, this was the, the main theory of, of the universe. And it was used to justify autocratic political systems as well as autocratic theological systems and in the names of, 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 of emulating the heavens. Well, this changed in 1543 with Copernicus and his heliocentrism, when all of a sudden he simplified things dramatically by saying, look, it's the sun. Things are orbiting the sun. We now understand the, the physics of, of all of this, or at least he proposed that. It led to a much, much simpler system than, than, than we're used to. So what I'm going to suggest, uh, oh, I want to mention one other thing, is that uh, the name of his book is called The Revolutionibus. Here it is. It's where it is in the title. And I don't think a lot of people know that this word is the stem for a word we use all the time now. It's the stem of the word revolution. It came from the revolution of the heavenly spheres. And what I'd like to suggest is that we need another heliocentric uh, revolution today and tomorrow, and I'm calling it heliocentrism 2.0. So it's a way to think about the sun in a new way, in a way to simplify and actually give us a lot of hope. OK, so we're going to talk about the sun. I've got to go back to astronomy here. The sun is a star. I don't think everybody even knows that, so I always got to make sure and talk about that. The sun is a gigantic star. It's our star. It's where we derive all our sustenance. It's also enormous. If you could put the Earth next to it, you'd need and multiply it. You could fill it with one million Earths. It's that big, OK? And the sun is also. It's, it's a gigantic nuclear furnace. At its center, it's 27 million degrees at its very center. It's generating energy at an enormous rate. In fact, 7 million tons of matter are converted into, into light energy every given second. To also put that in perspective, if you took 500,000 times the oil reserves in the planet Earth, the, the sun generates that in just one second or remaining oil reserve. It is an enormous power plant. Now, most of that light is waste, uh, wasted, if you will, and blown out to space, so it never reaches the Earth. But still, an awful lot does. And the ratio that you need to remember is 1,500. The amount of sunlight striking the Earth compared to how much we use per day, meaning humans in their activities, is 1,500 to 1. So there's plenty of it there. Here's what the number looks like. It's a 23 with. 15 zeros of watt years. Maybe it's a little easier to understand if I think of it as just a volume and compare it. If, if this sphere represented how much solar energy is falling on the surface of the Earth in any given year, this is about how much we use against the 1 1500. It's like a, a marble compared to a basketball. And let's stack that up against some of the other energies. If I total all the remaining energy underground, the energy we get from fossil fuels, stacks up like this. So even if all the remaining coal, all the remaining oil, all the remaining natural gas is still far less than it's deposited on the Earth every year. So this is really where the, the source of hope comes in. Not only is the sun steady, it will, it will keep its energy system steady for, for billions of years, practically forever. And it is also very constant. So this is where I think that hope comes. And we also have a lot of the technologies to pull this off already. Wind, even wind energy is just derived from solar heating the, the atmosphere. We have solar panels. We have electric vehicles, a lot of their electrical devices. Uh, we really have benefited from the, the carbon age being able to invent these things. Now we need to act responsibly in how we use them in the future. There's another thing that I thought this audience might find kind of interesting. If you, if you ask yourself, where does the sun shine the brightest and the longest? It comes out in this plot here with the darker red being where that is. And there's a little bit of social justice about where the solar energy is striking the Earth. Because it, it does strike more, it's more prevalent actually in many areas that are more, that 
not benefited in other ways. I'm going to end with just a, a personal story, again, this, sorry, involving my wife's family, which is from Tuscany. And so our family has gone to visit with our kids every few years for, for a long time. And one time, when my son was five years old, we were getting a high-speed tour by Bernardo, one of our cousins, who went through the, uh, a, a suburb of Florence called, called Arcetri. And I said, Bernardo, let us out. I've got to show Charlie something here. So we got out of the car, and I knew that our Chetri was where the, where the house was that the, where the Vatican imprisoned Galileo. Okay, so I wanted my five-year-old son to go see this. So we got there. We found the house. It said the jail of Galileo, uh, and, uh, and it had a fence up, and it had a warning signs and all, but those were in Italian. I couldn't read those, so I didn't think those <laughs> applied. So we broke, we climbed the fence, and we, we actually broke in the, we jimmied the door and got inside. So we were standing in the house of Galileo. And I'm explaining to my five-year-old son about Galileo and the Vatican, I guess. And the, the caretaker came in and asked us to leave. So we, they were nice and we left. We had a good story to tell that night. But you know, just five years ago, I went back, but this time through the front door. Franco Pacini, who unfortunately just passed away as a famous Italian astronomer, was a colleague of mine. He had a key. So this time I got to go in and get the, get the proper tour. And let me just say, if you ever get a house arrested, you know, like governors of Illinois, if you become one, make sure you get something like this. He had his own vineyard out back, right? So he, he was doing okay. And in the, in the study where Galileo was, uh, if you could look through the barred windows, Franco said to me, he says, Jim, you see that tree over in that right uh, thing there. I said, yeah. He says, that tree was there when Galileo was alive. So it really pressed upon me that this was not that long ago when Galileo lived and what he did. And what did he do? Why to an astronomer is Galileo so important? Well, Galileo was important because he took the idea of Copernicus and he proved that it was true. He went out and made observations. He did the science. He did the empiricism. And he did it with one of these. This was his telescope. That, he, that some people think he invented, but you know, in actuality, Galileo did not invent the telescope. It was invented by some Dutchman years earlier. Uh, what Galileo did was he improved upon it. He refined the telescope so that it was precise enough to do ex you know, extraordinary astronomical observations. It was with those observations that the scientific revolution happened, okay? And, and, and also all of the other things that came with the scientific revolution we know about, including the revolution in governments, revolution in the rights of man, and a whole different perspective. I keep thinking, occasionally I drive to see my brother, who you saw earlier. He lives down in Indianapolis. I occasionally drive through northern Indiana where these uh, wind turbines are, are, are turning. And I often think how much Galileo would love to see these things, because they were reminded maybe of windmills from his time, but also how it was able to take the energy of the sun and, and give it to, to make it useful for people. And I think this is where, where this, this, this story I'd like to just end with is that someone told me one time that, that the two most important things in the world are ideas and children. And if you just think about it, this, this young man, 14-year-old from Malawi, built a wind turbine two to power three light bulbs and two radios in his house. And it's really, I think, where the hope comes in is that with the, a new heliocentrism, we, we can get ourselves uncluttered from a lot of the confusion surrounding the, the challenges of climate change and energy, focus on the real source of where the light should be coming and energy should be coming from, and then focus also on the people who have something to give to help for this, and this will be the children of the future. So it's a rainy, cold day here in Chicago. I wish you bright days in the future, and I hope that you hope that we can solve the climate crisis. Thank you very much.